All right, Hebrews chapter 12 <clears throat> and um, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of uh, God. For consider him that endured such counterdiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he that whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without uh, chastisement, or of all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they, verily for a few days, hastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But rather, but let it rather be healed. Now tonight, and what I will do is I want to talk to you just a little bit about the, the, the way God disciplines, and why God disciplines. God disciplines us uh, not, in other words, discipline can fall into many categories. There's discipline that people receive because they do wrong. Uh, that's punishment, I guess is what you would call it. But you know when a person joins the military, uh, they go to boot camp, and they're there so that they can learn to be disciplined. And uh, you know, you're told uh, you know, how to cut your hair, you're told what to wear, uh, you're told when to get up, you're told when to go to bed, you uh, even have to, you, you, it's, it's sir, yes sir, sir, no sir. Uh, you march to Chow, you march to the bus stop, you march wherever you go. You get up early, you wash your clothes, you stand straight, you march, you march in time, and they're trying to weld you into a unit so that you can work together and you know how to function as, as a team. Now that's called discipline, discipline. And uh, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, in the text here, God disciplines those who come into his family. It, you know, a lot of times folks think that if they're having trouble, it means they are doing something wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. In other words, God may put you through some very difficult times so that he can prepare you for something greater that he has for you ahead. ahead. You know, a lot of folks bail out in boot camp. They never get past boot camp. They have to quit, and they come home. They can't take discipline. They can't take the they can't take the uh, uh, the strict uh, commands, and they they just are not able to be disciplined. And the Bible says, if you as a Christian are without discipline, if God never sends you to boot camp, if God doesn't uh, cross your path, if God doesn't give you some difficulty, if you don't have some things that would discipline you, I'm not saying disciplining yourself. I'm saying if God doesn't bring some things into your life as a Christian that would cause discipline in your life, then you're not a Christian. That's what it says. He says, if you be without this, then you're not a child of God. You're illegitimate. Now, God does chasten us when we do wrong. But uh, there's three things then that he mentions here uh, in these few verses that we ought to keep in mind if we are going to be a disciplined child of God. And the first thing is he talks about this cloud of witnesses here in verse 1. He says, Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And the cloud of witnesses are those uh, catalog in chapter 11. There in chapter 11, he talks about Abraham. And he talks about 
Sarah, and he talks about Joseph, and he talks about Jacob. He talks about, uh, uh, talks about uh, David and Abel and all of those down through there. He talks about, we call it the Hall of Fame. But then when he gets through with that chapter, he calls it a cloud of witnesses. He says, look at that cloud of witnesses and see how they were disciplined. I told you the story about a young man who a member of this church said to me some time ago, he said, I don't understand why things aren't going right. I've surrendered my life to God and trying to live for God, trying to do what God wants, and it just doesn't seem that, that anything's working out. I said, well, son, your mistake is the assumption that if you surrender your life to God, everything will work out. That is a sad mistake. Christians make that. You know what? We're all that way, but there, there seems to be this idea that if I live for God and surrender my life for God and sell out for God, I won't have any problems. There won't be any sickness. There won't be any cancer. There won't be any car wrecks. There won't be any tragedies. There won't be any wayward children. There won't be any wayward grandchildren. We, we kind of, or my family, you know, if I just surrender my life for God, my, my family will be wandering. It might not be. There's another member of my family. You understand? And there's children in your family. So we get this idea that if I surrender for God, everything's going to be okay. Well, if you really believe that, if you really believe that, then you must believe that if people don't surrender to God, nothing will be okay. But when you look at the world, that's not the way it is. The, the world, the way it appears, is the world has everything better than you. And by the way, in many cases, they do. Would you turn, I think, turn with me <coughs> to Psalm 70. 73 Psalm 73 here is a here is a man that uh, here is a man that that made us uh, this mistake in Psalm 70 um, 73 if I was going to title this psalm I would say God is good but sometimes I wonder because look at this psalm Truly God is, Psalm 73, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I, uh, at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as with a chain. Violence covereth them as garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. They are corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They are lofty. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocency. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I, would say, if I say, I will speak thus, behold, I, have, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. You notice what he's saying? He's saying, when I tried to do right and clean my heart up and get my act together and say I'm going to live for God, and then I look around and, and everybody else is living like the devil, and they have more, you know, here while you're working overtime and going to church and tithing and teaching a Sunday school class and trying to get things done, they wave to you as they leave in their 50-foot camper pulling their 40-foot boat with, with a Rolls Royce, you know, and they're heading for the mountains. See ya. See? And here you are, you know, you're trying to live for God and sacrifice and serve. And, uh, I mean, they have more than the heart could wish. Waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And I was envious at them, he said, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He said, they don't have any trouble. You know what? You go to the richest neighborhood in the Snohomish County. I don't care where you go. And I can tell you what's going on in those homes. You know what's going on in those homes? They're having divorces. You know what? That's, there's abuse. There's abuse going on in those homes. There's fornication going on in those homes. That's right. 
there's cancer going on in those homes. There's no difference. There's no difference. You think because somebody's house is painted a little better and it's got different lumber on it that the situation is different. And so you envy them. He said, I was foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he said, and the time I opened my mouth, I offended God's people. He says, can't seem to do anything right. And so what we need to realize is that God chastens us and disciplines us in order to make us more like him. That's his goal. He's not trying to destroy you. God's not trying to destroy you. Somebody crosses you up, God's not trying to destroy you. You have a problem with a brother or sister in Christ, God's not trying to destroy you. He might be trying to teach you something. You say, Wherefore, seeing we're encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. It's easy to get tangled up. And if you're going to run the race, you're going to have to lay the weights aside because they hinder you. Not only that, as you, as you, not only that, but he says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. Now, if we're going to run this race, we need to look to Jesus Christ who's already running. Now, he not only is the author, he set up the course. Now listen, Jesus is not going to ask you to run anywhere he hasn't already run. He's the author of the course. He's the author of the race. He's the author of the track. What do you think he's going to ask you to do that he hasn't gone through? You say, well, you don't know how lonely I am, Pastor. You don't know how lonely my life is. No, I don't. But I know somebody that does. Listen carefully. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Yeah? You say, yeah, but people misunderstand me. You know, they, they kind of think I'm nuts. Oh, yeah? Nobody understands. Yeah, well, you know about Jesus? They said he's demon-possessed. His own family went down to get him because they said, I said his own family, they went down to get him, they said he's beside himself. Well, when you're beside yourself, you got a problem. That's two of you. That's what they said. They said he's, he's, he's crazy. Yeah, you say, well, they went on to say he was demon-possessed. Said he was demon-possessed. So you see, you're not going to go through anything that Jesus hasn't already gone through. What, he, you couldn't possibly, because he's the author of the race. Not only is he the author who set up the course, he ran the course. Not only did he set it up for you to run it, he said, I'll run it before you. Amen. See? So he not only knows intellectually, he experienced everything you've experienced. He experienced everything you've experienced. You don't have any grief that he hasn't experienced. And that's why it says you need to look to Jesus Christ when you're running this race and when you're being chastened and when you're being disciplined and when you think nobody on this planet understands what you're going through. Why don't you look to Jesus Christ? He does understand. And by the way, it's unbelief and it's wickedness for us to imply that he doesn't understand. He does understand. I told you the story I'll tell you again a few years ago. I went into the doctor for colon surgery, colon cancer surgery. And my mother had four children, and one of them died with diphtheria when he was nine. The other one died as a baby, and the one died in birth. And I had diphtheria at about that same time. And then God spared me, I believe, in result of my grandfather's prayers. And then when I went to Bible college and graduated and came and started a church and had four kids, and I got sick and went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I don't have good news for you, and I had cancer of the colon. I tell you, when you're 31 years old, you've got four families, you've just got the whole world before you, you've just finished your education, and the doctor says, you've got colon cancer. What do you think goes through your mind? Now, you just stop and think. I mean, a man who's 31 years old is a young man. My doctor said to me, you're the young man I've ever seen with colon cancer. That's what he said, and he is the chief surgeon at Northwest Hospital, tumor specialist. My mother was in the waiting room. I didn't know this. She told me sometime later. But she said uh, she turned to God and she prayed, and she said, Lord, don't take my boy. He's all I got. 
and she said it was like a hand reached out and slapped her across the face and got her attention. And the voice seemed to say, I had one son, and I gave him for you. I'm going to tell you that had to be the Holy Spirit. Now, you know what the Lord was teaching her? That she is not going to go through anything that Jesus Christ hasn't already gone through. She only got one boy. God only had one. And he was perfect. You understand? You say, oh, I'm going to live right. Everything will go okay. No, they may not go okay. Teresa Avery. I was just looking at her picture here the other day. Any of you remember Teresa? Some of you do. Teresa Avery is one of the finest teenage girls I've ever seen. She is just an absolute, she was a jewel here at Open Door Baptist Church. A model for all of our teenage kids. She was upright, lived right, loved the Lord, wouldn't listen to the wrong kind of music, went soul winning, worked on our bus route, one of our fine bus captains. She grew up in this church, she graduated, she went up to Hiles Anderson. I'd go down to pastor school every year. She was so proud to see me. She'd bring all the kids. The kids, ever, she had friends everywhere. She'd say, that's my pastor. That's what they teach them there. You're supposed to point and say, that's my pastor. And that's what she'd do. I'd come on the campus. I'd hear that. That's my pastor. And she'd bring all these kids over and introduce them to me. She loved me. And she met some guy down at Bible College. And uh, they, you know, they fell in love. And they decided they wanted to get married. I don't know where he was from. She said, I want my pastor at Open Door Baptist Church to marry me. So they brought it. They came up here for the summer. We had a beautiful wedding. That was summer. They went up into, we went up into Vancouver for a few days for honeymoon. I was sitting in my office one day. I heard a knock on the door. I went to the door, and it was Teresa. What was her husband's name? Where's my wife? She went to look for my sermon, probably. Anyway, she, uh, <coughs> oh, what was her name? Scott, okay, uh, Scott, and I looked at the door, and there was Teresa and Scott, and they came in. They said, uh, we're just heading back for Hammond now. We want to stop and say thank you and say bye to you, and they came in, and we hugged and cried a little bit, and she went on out, and he, he said to me, he said, I just want to really thank you for raising a good girl for me. He said, I didn't raise her, but I took the credit, and uh, so I walked out to the car with him, and they had this small car and had it all packed with everything they had, all of their gifts and everything, and they headed off to Hammond. Getting ready to go back to school, they'd been back a couple of weeks, I guess, maybe a month, and he was uh, working nights, and she loved him, and she went down to a drive-in place, bought him some hamburgers, and was going to take him over to where he worked, and have, they were going to have hamburgers together, and she was going around a, around a highway, and a drunk came around the curve, and not only went over into her lane, but ran her completely off on the shoulder, and then went off, and the drunk went off on the shoulder and hit her head on all the way across the two lanes and on the shoulder and killed her instantly. I don't have any answer for that. I don't have any answer. But I don't charge God. I have no charge for God. I wept. I could hardly preach the funeral. The family came to me. They'd already been back to hand and wept. And finally the dad said to me right here, he said, Pastor, forgive me. I can't weep anymore. And I, I can understand that. They'd done their weeping, but I hadn't. I hadn't seen her, and, and they had her body here, and we had a picture, and we had a, had a funeral service. Folks, you're going to have to get over this idea. You are not going to bargain with God. If you think that you are going to surrender your life and live for God as a bargaining chip so that something won't happen to your kids, your motive is wrong. Your motive is wrong. Your motive is wrong. We are not playing games about this thing of surrendering. That's what a lot of folks think. They think, I've put my kids in Christian school, and I go to church, and I serve God, and there won't be any problem. You think so? Then you don't understand God. You don't understand God. You can't get away from problems. You can't get away from them. They come. You think Job got away from problems? Why, there wasn't a man as upright as Job. Nobody, nobody, if you put this combined group together, we probably wouldn't be, have the character Job had. And yet he lost all of his kids, lost all of his kids, lost his job, lost his farm, lost his cattle, lost his sheep, lost his health, lost his friends. And even his wife said, curse God and die. He said, you talk like a foolish woman. 
we, we got the good things from God, we're going to take the bad things. Some of you may remember many years ago, I don't know if any of you will remember Gene Springer. Gene Springer and I went to college together. When I was a student, I worked at a, at a machine shop and I met Brother Springer. He and I worked together. We started a little Bible study. He liked me and I was his friend. And when I went off to transfer to another college, he went with me and enrolled at Midwestern. We went to school together. He got saved in a classroom in Omaha, Nebraska, in a university, at the University of Omaha. He was sitting in a classroom reading church history in a secular university. And he'd been raised in American Baptist Church, and he, he accepted the Lord that day up there in the classroom at the university. He's a good guy. He and I went to school together. They graduated. Well, I graduated and was here a year or two, and then he came out here, and he said, I want to work with you for a while. He started a bus route. He went right down here, up and down the streets. Probably the first bus route, I think, Gene Springer headed up. Stopped right down here at the corner by Fred Meyer. You know, Fred Meyer, I don't know what the streets are. You've got 44th that goes on one side of Fred Meyer, uh, north and south. And then you've got the other street that runs parallel with it, uh, with 40. It's 40-something. 40 and right there on the corner, there's a family that uh, started sending their kids to our Sunday school. One boy was just about this old, and the other one was just a little kid, maybe four years old. They started coming here. I'm, Gene said, I want you to meet the family because I'm going back to Omaha and he took me in, around on his bus route and introduced me to the parents. He took me to, these, to this house. He took me to the house and, um, and uh, introduced them. And they said, well, preacher, you won't be seeing us much. We go camping every Sunday. And I said, fine. And it wasn't long until I led them to the Lord and they forgot all about camping. And they came to church every Sunday, faithful in this church. Kids grew up in this church, got saved here. Just the other day, I got a phone call. The youngest boy, who was 27 years old, he and two other friends had gone deer hunting over Clee Ellum. They were driving along, and they looked out the window, and they saw a deer. They'd been up there three days, and they were on their way back, and they saw a deer. The three of them jumped on the pickup truck, put shells in their gun. By this time, the deer had loped off to safety. The guys jumped back in. Two of them jumped in the cab. The young boy, 27-year-old boy that grew up in this church, jumped in the back of the pickup and sat on the wheel well. They thought they would cruise the road in case they saw another deer. No one was aware that the gun in the cab was loaded. The driver took the gun, he put the stock down in the floorboard and the gun was laying across the front of the seat. And you know what I'm gonna tell you. The gun went off, the bullet went through the back of the seat, went through the back of the cab and fragmented and a piece of that bullet went right through his head and killed him instantly. Killed him instantly. That's Todd Hall, Jack and Lynn Hall's boy. Lynn Hall, you've seen her. She's been here many times. I went down to see him when I heard. I went down right after, it was right after a Thursday night service. I went down to their home. Jack came to the door and he wrapped his arms around me and he wept. And he wept and we talked. He said, Lynn is in the bed. We haven't been able to sleep. We had so many people who care, and they just keep calling, and we can't get any sleep. I'd sat there about 20 minutes, and she came out of the bedroom, and she hugged me and sat down, and we talked. And she said to me, she said, Pastor, when I got the news, I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to do. And I went out in the backyard of my house, and I said, God, how can I handle this? And she said a verse of Scripture came to me and said, Job said, blessed, naked came I into this world, and I will return naked. Came from my mother's womb, naked, naked shall I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And she said, Pastor, I got on my knees in my backyard, and I said, God, blessed be your name. And she said, I don't understand it. But she says, I have complete victory and peace over what has happened. I wish you could see a letter that I had on my desk. She, she, she came by and gave it to my secretary, and she gave it to me. It was a two-page letter that she wrote to the prosecutor over in Cleellum. God gives and God takes away. Job never charged God foolishly. You know why the Lord allows some of these things to happen? God allows them to happen 
to bring us to the end of ourselves. Your self-sufficiency is your problem. Now you believe that. But your self-sufficiency is your problem. We are so used to being in the driver's seat. I mean, I've been driving this old car I've got for so many years, and when I get in a car with somebody and I'm not under the wheel, I'm not comfortable. You that way, you're used to driving. And you get over here in the passenger seat, you know, with your wife or with one of your kids, and you just, you know, you just kind of claw, and you know, you got your fingernails in the dash, you know. Boy, if I had a hold of this wheel, I would feel so much more comfortable. And that's the problem with you and me. We've had a hold of the wheel of our life for so long, we've become comfortable. And so God kind of jerks the wheel and says, let me drive. And we just fall apart. I'm going to quit on God. You're going to quit on God? You're going to quit on God? What are you doing? Are you bargaining with God? Are you living for God so, you won't have, so there won't be any trouble in your family? That's not the right motive for living for God. The right motive for living for God is because He is God and He deserves your love. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, He completed it. And because He completed it, you will complete it and you can complete it. I've told the story so many times. A man said to Mr. Spurgeon one time, he said, Mr. Spurgeon, I don't think I have dying grace. And Mr. Spurgeon said, are you dying? He said, no, sir. He said, you don't need it. I'm telling you, you do have dying grace because he said, my grace is sufficient for you. It's sufficient. And it will be sufficient. When you go through the valley, his grace is sufficient. When you go through the storm, and you will, Christian, if you live long enough, you'll go through the storm. But I plead with you to go through it. When you're thrown in the fiery furnace, take the Son of Man with you. When you're thrown in the lion's den, claim the presence of the Son of Man. There's an interesting thing there in Hebrews chapter 11. If you'll look with me quickly, I want to show you something. This will help you, I think. <clears throat> would you look at Hebrews chapter 11 you know we sometimes get the idea that the men in the Old Testament were supermen and that because they were delivered that means everybody was delivered but nothing could be further from the truth sometimes God gives us great deliverance I have, I'm convinced that there are many things that we've been delivered from and only, only eternity will show how close we were to death and God delivered us But look at verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David and Samuel and of the prophets, verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained the promises of lions, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Boy, now that's what we envy. We think that is what Christianity is. We think if I live for God, that's the way it'll be. But there's another side to that coin that you ought to read. And it's in the very next verse. Look at it. He said... <clears throat> Others, you see it? And others, you see those others? They were just as righteous as the ones above. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings and bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world is not worthy. They wandered in dens and in mountains. I'm sorry. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. 
That's the other side of it. Now, you tell me which group was most righteous. You couldn't. God in his sovereignty elects in some cases to give great deliverance to some people, but it's for his glory. God in his sovereignty elects to take some people home for his glory. And your attitude and my attitude ought to me, glory be to God. If you were the mother of one of those five missionaries killed in Ecuador, you would, be ask, you would have been asking why. Nate Saint and Elliot and the others, you would have been asking why. If it had been your son or your husband, you would have been asking why. But do you know some 40 or 50 years later, nobody asks why? Nobody asks why. You know why? Because the wives of those five missionaries turned right around and became missionaries to those Indians down there. They went in and they won those Indians to Christ and became the greatest example of missionary endeavor in the 20th century. What did it cost the lives of five missionaries? I saw the pictures of them laying there in the river with spears in their backs. I read the story about how they were mutilated. Just while I was in Venezuela here a couple of years ago, there were missionaries captured down in South America. I get letters constantly from, from uh, new tribes. They still haven't found those four or five men that were captured when we were down in that area. They haven't found them. And when they find them, they'll be dead. I have no doubt about it. What's it worth? I'll tell you what. It'll be worth gold when you get to heaven. It'll be worth gold. And that's why during the storm you can't understand what God is doing. You know Seattle's a dreary place. It's a dreary place. Drizzling rain all day long. If it isn't rain, it's fog. If it isn't fog, you know, it's just like somebody turned all the lights out in this place. But you know, you know what faith says? Just on the top side of all of those clouds, it's like beautiful snow. And if you could just get in an airplane and go right up through it, you'd see beauty like you've never seen. It's there. It's there. God knows what's going on. And sometimes in our life, and I've been there many times, and you have and you will be, but listen, just remember that there's a heavenly Father above the storm. My mother, when I was a little boy, my mother used to, she used to uh, crochet. What you would do is you would get a piece of cloth and you could buy these patterns. They, um, and you iron them on the cloth. You would take the pattern, you'd lay the cloth down on the ironing board and you would take a warm iron and you would iron the pattern that looked like a blueprint or looked like wax paper with blue lines and you would, you would, uh, you'd iron that on the cloth. And there'd be, you know, you'd have this, this pattern and then you had round rings about this, about this size. They were usually made out of cane or wood or something. And one was just slightly larger than the other. And you would lay the cloth over the smaller ring and then you would slip the larger ring down over it and it made a real tight, round uh, a pattern there that you could work with. And my mother used to set, she'd have a thimble on her finger, have the needle and have the thread. She'd sit there and she'd be knitting. And I was a little boy sitting on the floor and I'd look up and I'd say, what are you doing? And she'd say, I'm making something beautiful. And I looked up from the bottom side, I said, man, it doesn't look beautiful from down here. This looks like a bunch of strings and a bunch of gnarly thread from down here where I'm looking at it. I said, let me see. She said, I'll let you see after a while. And she said, it'll be pretty. And I waited and I waited and I waited and one day she said, it's all finished. And she took the hoops off of it and showed it to me and it was a beautiful picture of flowers and sunshine and gardens. It was all there. And I look up sometimes and I say, God, what are you doing? I mean, there's cancer everywhere. There's trouble everywhere. Christians are 
fighting and bickering and they're losing their jobs and losing their families and losing their health and people are discontent and folks uh, that have divorce and runaways and all kinds of problems and I just look up and I say God what are you doing uh, he said I'm making a beautiful picture I said man it sure doesn't look pretty from down here he says trust me I'll show you I'll show you and one of these days he's going to say it's all done come on up and look at it amen and you know what you're going to say why the half hadn't been told the half hadn't been told so why don't you just let the master go ahead and make his make his uh, tapestry let him make his whatever he's making just let him make it you know and if he wants to use you to dye some of the thread so be it if he wants you to be one of the strands of the thread so be it maybe you'll be one of those that heroes that are delivered and maybe you'll be one of those martyrs delivered unto death but what difference does it make? Could it possibly make any difference? No, it couldn't. It cannot. Paul said, I'm not only, they wept on his neck there in Acts chapter 19. And he said, what do you mean to weep on my neck and to make all of this ado? Why, he said, I'm not only willing to go to Jerusalem and be bound. I'm willing to go there and die. Neither count I my life dear unto me, he said. So Christian, let's look to the cloud of witnesses that's gone before.